from Israel. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. Well, I hope that you're all full from your wonderful Yom Ha'atzma'ut or Israel Independence Day barbecues. By the way, if you don't live in Israel, you should know that that's what everybody does here in Israel. Everybody on Yom Ha'atzma'ut, on Israel's Independence Day, you go to a barbecue, you make a barbecue, you have your family over, your friends over. It's a lot of fun. We have the steaks and the potato salad and everything. And I was watching some videos also seeing how far we have come from 75 years ago when we were in the midst of the Holocaust. And then you look at Israel today as a free country, a free nation with our own army, technologically advanced. It's just a miracle. And anybody who doesn't see the miracle has their eyes closed or has their heart closed. Just open your eyes. You see the ingathering of the exiles. It's just amazing. And it's been such a wonderful day. I just don't want it to end. Except for now, I'm going to be doing a very interesting interview with uh, our guest, Rabbi Yaron uh, Reuven. He is a rabbi who you will see on YouTube a lot. He gives these short videos and longer ones as well. And he's really, really interesting. We're going, to, we're going to be talking about the end of days. He just put out a video about this and about North Korea and some interesting things. So we're going to open up the lines and let you call into the show today as well. If you have any comments or questions for the rabbi, you can call in. That is if you're listening live, if it's between 8 to 9 p.m. holy time right here in the land of Israel on Tuesday evening or if it's between 1 to 2 p.m. New York time, Eastern time, that means that we are live and you can call in. Our numbers are on our homepage at the top of the page. You can also join me in the chat room. Uh, you can put your questions in there as well, and we'll try to ask the rabbi. And also, I uh, just want to say hi to everybody from around the world who's listening in. And uh, it's great to see you all, United, all over the United States, Israel. Oh, look. They're listening from Korea right now. Isn't that interesting? Hi to our listener in Korea. Don't worry. I don't know who you are. I just know that we have listeners there. Okay. Also from Australia, the land down under, and from France, and from the United Kingdom, listeners from all over the world, it's great to see you all here. By the way, if if, uh, the listener from Korea should stay on the air because, very interesting, the name Seoul, which is their capital city, means something very interesting in Hebrew. And it's written out. Mm. Listen for the show. Anyway, we'll be right back, everybody. Don't go away. It's going to be a great show. Hi, this is Heather Dean. Is your home sweet home just a place to hang your hat? Check out The Modern Jewish Home every Wednesday at 5 p.m. for practical advice from a wide variety of experts and innovators about relationships, getting organized, growing your business, nourishing your body and soul, and even having a good laugh. So make yourself at home every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Israel time on The Modern Jewish Home here on Israel News Talk Radio. Israel is 69 years old. It's interesting because next year when we're 70, I was just thinking coincidentally that it was 70 years between the time of the first temple until we had the second temple here in Jerusalem. Is something going to happen? Are we living in an era of the messianic era? Well, we're going to be talking about the end of days on this show and our guest is Rabbi Yaron Reuven. He was born in Netanya. Israel, and he began his American dream, quote unquote, at the age of 10, when his family immigrated to the United States. Yaron went from newspaper boy at age 10 to a well-known, self-made Wall Street multimillionaire by the age of 23. He was featured on CNBC, Bloomberg, and Chinese NDTV, and before he left Wall Street, He owned his own private brokerage firm, as well as a hedge fund and international insurance agency. At the age of just 26 years old, he faced a seven-year battle for his life 
from a simple surgery that went wrong. From there, his life would never be the same. His miraculous tshuva story, or his return to Torah observance, brought him to the studying and teaching of Torah for the purpose of saving souls and bringing them back to God and his Torah. After 16 years on Wall Street, Yaron decided to dedicate the rest of his life spreading the truth and divinity of the Torah through scientific proofs and many other methods to reach each individual listener. Now, you can uh, find his videos on YouTube or on his website. You can go visit it at beezrathashem.org. We will link to his page from our radio page, and you can uh, go there after the show and watch his videos. Many of them are very short, four minutes, five minutes, six minutes, and some of them are much longer for different topics that he talks about. So welcome to the show, Rabbi Yaron Reuven. Thank you for having me, Dr. Hashem. Thank you. It's good to have you on. So uh, you just put out a six-minute video called Who Will Shoot First? with the byline of with, uh, with World War III or Gog and Magog already in the makings, we need God's help now more than ever. So tell us about that video. Sure. I mean, I think that anyone that uh, takes just a few minutes to look around, whether they want to, you know, listen to the radio or watch the news, read the newspapers, it's not really much of a secret that the Third World War has already started. Uh, the only difference between this war and, let's say, some of the more famous wars that we had in recent years is that this one is being fought quietly uh, so far. Uh, and if you look at even past history, most of the big wars usually started you know, by uh, one or two countries. They were quiet for a while. A few others jumped in. Uh, and little by little, it became a world war that uh, was you know, undoubtable, something that changed history as we know it. And uh, the way I look at the world right now, that this world war has already started. Um, the reality of it is that um, when you had Russia decide to go and fight full force against ISIS, I mean, you know, you initially people thought, oh, wow, this is such a great cause, this is such a great thing, fight the terrorists, and so on. But then certain things started not adding up. Uh, when they sent a ship with 200 atomic bombs uh, to Syria, you already knew that it's not really about Syria anymore. It's not really about ISIS anymore because you don't really even need one atomic bomb for ISIS, let alone 200. Now, uh, and anyone that wants to double-check everything that I'm saying, whether it's news sources or Torah verses that I'm mentioning, is you know more than welcome to check it themselves. And you look at the news also, uh, that just in a, um, a little less than a year ago, Russia decided that 200 atomic bombs were not enough, so they sent the uh, largest submarine that they have, and the largest submarine in the world, that has even more atomic bombs than the ship. Meaning, 200 atomic bombs are not enough, we're going to use even more, as if this is, you know, for ISIS again. So obviously we're, sh we're seeing that Russia is using force. Uh, whether they're intending on using them or not is obviously uh, only Hashem knows. But the reality of it is that the war, the war is happening. And we're seeing that the United States is not exactly best friends with them anymore. We're seeing that North Korea is becoming much more vocal. We're seeing that Iran would press the trigger if they had one. We're seeing that really everyone is looking for a fight. And not unlike history, Israel is always the victim. Israel is always the one that everyone blames for some reason or another. And everyone hates it. It's almost become popular to become anti-Semitic. And Am Yisrael is at a position where they have to decide, are we going to make the same mistake that we've made countless times in the past, which is to rely on ourselves, to rely on our weapons, to rely on our mind, to rely on our strength, or are we going to go to the only source of strength, which is Hashem Yisrael? And that's one thing that I try to encourage people, because again, the war is not a secret. The, the only thing that's, you know, I, I guess up in the air now is what we're going to do about it. Okay, so basically uh, what you're saying is, is that this war, I, well, I think most people believe it's like a religious war, and perhaps because it's not a war of 
borders uh, per se, where you're actually seeing troops occupying other countries, except for ISIS. But it's it's chaos there. Um, we're seeing something where people are really going to have to use a lot of uh, their spiritual faith in order to survive this. Would you agree? Absolutely. Uh, I think that the only thing that uh, we have left is Avinu uh, and uh, you know our, our Father in Heaven. That uh, you know we're in a position right now where just like the prophets were told by Hashem that uh, at the end of the times there's going to be certain events that take place, and we mentioned in the video different prophecies that the Gemara Masechet Sota, page 49b, mentions. And really, when you read this Gemara, it's almost like reading a newspaper. You know, you see because at the time that this Gemara was written. It, the world was very, very different. You know, people think, oh, yeah, well, you know, they, they predicted promiscuity. They predicted a generation that's, uh, you know, completely full of chutzpani and people that have, you know, no, no shame whatsoever. They predicted a generation where the, uh, the young people are going to scare the old people. They predicted a generation where the daughter-in-law is going to fight the mother-in-law. But in today's age, for this generation, this is all normal day to day. But in 2,000 years ago, this was as far as the splitting the ocean. This was not something that was, that was common. And uh, one of the things that Hashem that said to the prophets, said to Zachariah, said to Ezekiel, there's going to be certain events that take place at this Gogol Magog, at this World War III, at the Armageddon, if you will, uh, that uh, is going to give you an indication that this is it. And we're seeing all of these signs. I mean, first and foremost, we're seeing that obviously everybody wants to fight. Everyone is, uh, but really without a real cause. It's not like they're all fighting for land. No one wants Syria. No one wants uh, any particular land. They're fighting just because, uh, which is one reason, one reason alone to see that this is obviously a spiritual war. This is a war that's dictated from Shemaim. And uh, from, from heaven. They just tell us, right. We, we just need you to translate any words that you use in Hebrew into English so people who don't understand Hebrew can understand. Yes, of course. Uh, so our sages tell us that um, each country has their own malach, has their own angel, that is in essence supervising it. That Hashem put there, not because Hashem needs their help, but it's the way of a king is to have servants. So he put a different malach, he put a different angel to supervise each country. So for example, in the, uh, the Midrash, uh, tells us that uh, in the days of Yam Suf, in the days of you know the uh, st- in the splitting of the ocean of the Sea of Reeds, the angel called Mitzrayim, which is another name for um, Egypt in Hebrew, um, told Hashem, you know, why would you split the ocean? So over there we learn that Egypt has a angel named Egypt or Mitzrayim. So in essence, each one of these countries has their own angel, and interestingly enough. When there is a war here, in this world, it's not starting here. It started up there. There's usually a fight in Shemaim. There's usually a fight in heaven uh, between these two angels, uh, and that leads to some type of conflict here, which eventually leads to a bigger war in Shemaim. So every war that we have in this world has a connection spiritually. Now, this specific one is very different. And the reason why is because, according to our prophets and all the signs that we have, uh, if this war is indeed the war that we believe it is, this is going to be the last one. Uh, it's not going to end pretty. Uh, it's going to be one of those wars where the whole world is going to get together. Initially, it's going to be two major religions like Christianity and Islam fighting each other. Uh, and according to the prophets, eventually they stop and, and decide that it's all the fault of the Jews, and they're all going to... Hashem you know, may Hashem have mercy, uh, they're all going to gather together and fight Israel together. Uh, so in a situation like this, when you see a world comprised of approximately 7.5 billion people, and a Jewish world in Israel, you know, you have 7 million people, 6 million of them approximately, 6, 7 million of them approximately are Jews. You have world Jewry in law, at large is maybe 13, 14 million Jews give or take, you have 7.5 billion people fighting 14 million, obviously the only chance you have is by relying on your Father in Heaven, the uh, uh, Iron Dome and any missiles and any planes and any Prime Minister and any intellect that we've ever had before is not going to survive a few hours. Mm -hmm. This is all going to transplant. 
exactly how the Prophet say will. So the question is, how long are we going to wait? Are we going to Okay, okay, let's let's just hold it right there if we can because we're about to take a break. Again, we're speaking with Rabbi Yaron Reuven. He is uh, talking to us about the end of days, the times of the Messiah, the wars that we may be seeing uh, swelling up here in the world. And if you have any comments or questions, you can join us in our chat room. That's the orange button on our website at the top of the page. Or if you're listening on our player, it's the orange button going across the page. Click on that. You can write your questions in there and we can uh, read them for the rabbi. So don't go anywhere. We're going to be right back. Hi, everybody. This is Jay Shapiro, and I want to know if you're having trouble figuring out what's happening here in the Middle East. Are you confused by all the information coming at you, and are you losing sleep because you're worried about Israel? Well, I have a program each week in which I try to get behind the news and analyze what's really happening in simple terms so you don't have to be an expert to be knowledgeable. Keep tuned to the Jay Shapiro program each week, and we'll try to stay awake together. Back here at Israel News Talk Radio, I'm Tamar Yona, and we're speaking about the end of days, the times of the Messiah. Are we living in the era, the Messianic era? Are we going to be seeing huge wars taking place? What's going to What's going to be? What is, What do Jewish sources say about that? So we have with us this evening Rabbi Yaron Reuven, and he's talking to us about all of these uh, topics. If you want, if you have any questions, you can write them in our chat room. It's the orange button on our website, and I will try to read them out to him. And uh, I just want to say also that after the after the uh, show, after you're listening to it, if you want to check out his website, you can do so. We'll link to his website, and you can see some of his videos as well. So welcome back to the show, Rabbi Reuven. Glad to be here. Okay. All right, so let me ask you this. Um, First, why don't you just to describe to our listeners uh, what Judaism says, who the Mashiach, the Messiah, is going to be, and what has to take place before he comes? Well, the Mashiach, just like uh, any of the uh, Jewish kings that were uh, picked in the past, whether it was uh, King Saul uh, or uh, King David or King Solomon uh, or even Moses, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu himself, uh, unlike the uh, democratic system or authoritarian systems that we have in the world today, uh, these uh, kings were elected by people or by power that's, uh, you know, uh, full of corruption. The, uh, the Messiah, just like the kings of the past, has to be selected by Hashem himself, uh, meaning that it's not an election process, it's not who's most popular, it's not who people think is most popular or most righteous, only Hashem knows what's in our hearts, which is one of the 13 principles of faith. In order for someone to say that they believe in the full Torah, they have to follow the Rambam's 13 principles of faith. And one of them is uh, that Hashem knows what's in our hearts. So first and foremost, we have to understand that uh, Hashem is going to pick him. Now, how are you going to know whether Hashem picked him or not? Just like we saw in Mount Sinai, when uh, in the book of uh, Joshua, when uh, Joshua met, uh, obviously, the, this new country that they, they've never been to, but he heard something extraordinary. He, sh- he heard from Rachav that uh, they heard what Hashem told them in Mount Sinai. Now, obviously, there was no radio back then. There was no television back then. There was no Internet. How did they hear? And the reason, how, the way they heard is because Hashem wanted to make sure that it's not only Israel that heard the message of Mount Sinai, but the entire world heard it. So there was no doubt by any country or anyone that lived at that time that the event at Mount Sinai actually happened. The words that Hashem said appeared in the sky. The sounds were deafening and were heard around the world. This was not a message that was exclusive just to the Jews that were at Mount Sinai. This message was spread around the world, uh, and to such an extent that no one ever said, hey, listen, we don't believe the Mount Sinai uh, event happened. 
everyone knew that it happened, and that's we actually have you know witnesses that were not Jews that actually had a vested interest to go against it. Uh, actually said that it did happen. So one of the main things that we know, we understand from here, is that when Hashem wants to be heard, He's not going to leave anything to doubt. Mm -hmm. And that's the same thing that we expect and know is going to happen when the Mashiach is going to come, unlike Christianity or Islam that believes that uh, they uh, have their own messengers, their own prophets, or their own people that spoke to God, but there's no witnesses. There's no evidence. There's just somebody that says a story, some woman had a dream, or some guy went into the desert, but nobody was with him. And this is all against what it says in the Torah. If Hashem made sure that the biggest event in history, the first big event in history, Mount Sinai, was going to be heard by the entire world, then obviously you don't need to be a genius to realize that an even bigger event, which is the culmination of this world, is going to definitely going to be heard around the world and is not going to be left to doubt. It's not going to be left to some uh, possibilities. So that's the first thing we know is that this message is going to be heard around the world, whether it's going to be the sounds of Shofar or sounds from Shemaim. We're only going to know once we get there. But one main thing we also know is that uh, Hashem told the prophet Malachi in the, uh, in, in, in the book of well, Malachi chapter 3, verse 23, is that he's also going to give us you know, an initial sign, aside from all of the wars and craziness that's going to happen at that time, is going to be a very, very simple message. And what's that message? He's going to send a messenger by the name of Elijah the prophet. And in chapter 3, 23, uh, verse 23, he says, Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and awesome day of Hashem. So here we see that Hashem is telling us specifically, and you can continue reading on, it gives more details of what's going to happen. Hashem is telling you, I'm going to send him three days before the Mashiach officially arrives. That way, there's going to be no doubt whatsoever. There's not going to be anyone that says, no, this is not the Mashiach, or maybe this is the Mashiach. There's not going to be any question whatsoever. Once the Mashiach arrives, there's going to be 100% conviction by the entire world of who he is, what he is, and of course he's going to be a human being. He's not, uh, you know, he's not God himself or anything like that. Some people think he's not an angel. He's just a human being that's extremely righteous, who at this moment most likely does not know he's the Mashiach. And according to our sages, he's not going to know he's the Mashiach until Hashem officially selects him to be the Mashiach. But once he actually officially is inaugurated as the Mashiach, there has to be uh, an oil that's uh, poured on him, the same oil that Moshe Rabenu put on Aaron Cohen, and the same oil that was put on King David and King Saul and King Solomon. And there has to be, obviously, an inauguration, a holy inauguration process that takes place. But most importantly, this person, this human being, is going to be extremely righteous in accordance to the Torah. Not in accordance to man not in accordance to some new book that was uh, written by people like the New Testament or the Quran, but according to the Torah that's divine that was written once and is never going to be rewritten. And most importantly after that is that he's going to be given powers that are above human. Due to his kedusha, due to the powers that Hashem instills in him, he's going to be able to smell the sins or, in essence, the, the righteousness or wickedness of the people and he's not going to be like a judge or a jury that's going to have to uh, need evidence and witnesses to know who's righteous and who's not. He's going to be able to smell the sins off of the wicked people, and obviously the, uh, the mitzvot, the, the, the good deeds off of the righteous people, and those that are righteous in accordance to the Torah will be saved. Whether they're Jews or Gentiles is irrelevant. If they're righteous according to the Torah, they have nothing to worry about. If they're going against the Torah, then... They have everything to worry about. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me throw a monkey wrench in here just for a minute because, the you know, we know that at any time during history, if the if uh, mankind deserved it, if the Jewish people did what they were supposed to be doing also, we would have seen the Mashiach coming. And we know that, you know, Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, and even King David, the, the highest figures of Judaism, even they were not uh, respected by everyone. Even they had people who rebelled against them. Do you think the same thing's going to happen when the Messiah comes, that 
that there's going to be people also saying he's not the Messiah. Why do I have to listen to him? You know, uh, and and will re- will rebel? Uh, yes. Well, there is a the sages teach us in the Zohar, and also in the Gemara in different places where there's actually going to be an erev rav. There's going to be uh, of several different enemies that the Mashiach is going to have to fight. Uh, one of them, obviously, at large, is going to be the the wicked. Uh, Gentiles that want to go against Am Israel, well, whether that's North Korea or that's the, uh, you know, different uh, parts of Amalek, uh, the nation that Hashem created in essence uh, to be the enemy of, uh, of Am Israel from creation, uh, which is debatable who they are today because obviously we've had uh, a lot of uh, uh, things spread all over the world in the, uh, over the last few thousand years, so we don't know for sure who Amalek is, but so the, the biggest enemy at large is going to be them. Uh, and Hashem says that in this war of Gog and Magog, unfortunately, one of the most horrific events is that two-thirds of the world is going to be wiped out instantly. And according to the Arizal, uh, this is going to take place in nine minutes. Uh, now, at the time that the Arizal wrote this, several hundred years ago, people laughed at it. They said, listen, you know, at this time, the best weapon we have you know, even if everyone shot a gun or even if everyone, you know, uh, shot a spear, it would still, you know, not even do anything to the whole world at large in nine minutes. But today we know how this is all possible in even less time because of the atomic bombs. And we see in the book of Zechariah how they actually even describe an atomic bomb taking place. Hmm. So that's one enemy. The second part of the enemy is going to be the Erev Rav. The Erev Rav, unfortunately, are Jews that have, uh, you know, uh, from birth that are heretics, that are going to go against the Torah and don't want the Mashiach to come. And uh, this is going to be a very big enemy of the Mashiach, but of course uh, there's, uh, the Mashiach is going to have supernatural uh, power uh, instilled in him, so uh, he's going to destroy all of them. Hmm. All right, um, we're coming to a break in another uh, minute or so, but I want to ask you this very, very quickly, if you can answer it in like 30 seconds. They say that uh, when the Messiah comes, there. Uh, Tshuva or our repentance won't uh, be as worth it uh, anymore because we'll have God revealed in the world. And also those who want to convert won't be able to convert anymore. Uh, but but what about people who are, are in a conversion program? Because it takes a year or two to convert, usually. Uh, what about those? Uh, is it that the Messiah comes and now, even though they're in the middle of their courses, they won't be able to become Jews really quickly? Well, the, 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 the Gemara of Udaz Zarah, page 3b, talks about how there's not going to be any more converts once the Mashiach comes because it's not going to be free choice anymore. It's obviously you know who's the winner, you know who's the leader. But anyone that is in the process of converting, anyone that actually has it deeply in their heart to convert in the process, Hashem knows what's in their heart. That's one of the 13 principles of faith. So we know that Hashem obviously is going to uh, allow those people to join Ami Fred because okay. in their heart. Okay, hold it right there. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. Howdy from the heartland. This is David Haivri. Would you like to know what it's like to live in the wild West Bank? No, that is a mistake. This is not the West Bank. This is the heartland of Israel, Judea and Samaria. Israel is under attack on Facebook and social media and the campuses in newspapers. They are spreading lies and false information about Israel. This is David Haivri. Join me every Tuesday at 6 p.m. Israel time from a Hebrew in the heartland, and I am going to provide you real information and tools that you can use to defend Israel. You too will become a warrior to protect this holy nation. Show on Israel News Talk Radio, and we're talking about the end of days. 
the are we living in the messianic era as what we're seeing with Korea and ISIS and gatherings of troops with Russia in the Middle East now and China getting ready for battle and possibly even Trump facing off with the North Koreans. Uh, a lot is happening in the news. So what's going on? Are we indeed living in the messianic time? Is this World War III? We're speaking with our guest today, Rabbi Yaron Reuven. He, he is talking to us about all of this and we have lots of questions for you uh, on this side of the show. But before we uh, we do that, Rabbi, I just wanted you to just very quickly uh, go over what you said about the converts, people who are in the middle of a conversion program, and let's say the Messiah comes, and then what happens? Can they convert or can't they? Once it, once someone knows that their uh, 13 principles of faith are that Hashem knows what's in your heart, which means that Hashem knows if you truly want to convert to Orthodox Judaism by accepting and fulfilling all of the mitzvot, then uh, you have nothing to worry about, because even if there's a delay in your conversion because of politics and red tape and everything else, Hashem knows what's in your heart and you'll be allowed to convert. But again, Hashem knows what's in your heart. Okay. Another quick question I have, it just came up. Uh, what about the, ten, the lost ten tribes of Israel? Do they come back uh, before the world, the world is destroyed, after the world is destroyed, according to what you were talking about, two-thirds of the world's going to be, God forbid, nuked? Well, that's going to be part of the uh, job of the Mashiach, is going to unite the lost tribes. And uh, I think most importantly that people need to understand with everything that you mentioned before, with Japan wanting to go to war, China wanting to go to war, America, everyone else is looking to go to war. All Obviously, we see that the world at large is heating up. So where do we see this in the Torah? In the book of Exodus, in uh, chapter 5, uh, the end of chapter 5 and, and, and also 6, we see that Moshe Rabbeinu, Right before the exodus, the, the original exodus of Mitzrayim, of Egypt, uh, of Am Yisrael leaving Egypt, we see that Moshe Rabbeinu comes to Hashem and says, God, why did you send me there? Since, I've got, since I went there, it all be, only became worse. You know, Paro made everything more difficult. And we see that in chapter 6, verse 1, Hashem answers Moses and says the following, Now you will see what I shall do to Paro, to Pharaoh, for through a strong hand will he send them out, and with a strong hand will he drive them from his land. It seems like the question and the answer are not connected, but, very, but if you look at the details, they very much are, meaning that the difficulty increased drastically right before the climax, right before the actual exodus itself, and Hashem is explaining why. He said that it needed to become much more difficult before there was enough merit for me to expedite this exodus, because really it was supposed to be 400 years. It's only been 210. So in order for me to expedite this exile, this original Mashiach, I had to make things even more difficult. And that's one of the things that we see, and unfortunately we're going to see in the coming future, that things will become much more difficult, but anyone that believes in the real Hashem knows that's only for our good. All right. Uh, Rabbi David, who is in the chat room, is asking, will all the Jews survive the last war? Well, any Jew that is righteous and is fulfilling the will of Hashem, according to the Torah, has nothing to worry about. Any Jew that is not fulfilling the, what's co according to the Torah has everything to worry about, because unfortunately, some of the sins, like, for example, violation of Shabbat, uh, is uh, on purpose, not just accidental, puts a person, puts a Jew's Judaism on suspension, which means that according to the Rambam and Yochot Shabbat and according to our sages, he's considered an idol worshiper. So obviously a Jew in that particular situation is in a very, very deep problem and needs to start doing tshuva as soon as possible. Okay, and uh, what about... Uh after the Messiah comes. So can you give us like a timeline? Like, is it first, you know, we see these nuclear wars possibly with Korea or what's going on in Syria with Russia, and then the Messiah comes? Uh, how does it work? Give, give a timeline. Well, I believe that uh, the Rambam said it best, is that we're only going to know exactly what's going to happen uh, with the Mashiach when it actually happens. I mean, there's a lot of different possibilities of what's going to happen. In essence, uh, you know, uh, I guess vaguely you can say that there's first there's going to be a lot of chaos, similar to what we saw in previous events, like the original Exodus we just mentioned, that's mentioned in the book of Exodus. Uh, so we see that there was a lot of hardship, increased hardship even more than the, the, the already horrendous hardship they already had. I believe that that's going to be repeated again. 
Uh, and then you're going to have, uh, uh, you know, the exile and uh, the messianic uh, salvation uh, begin. But even once the Mashiach comes, it's not necessarily going to become Gan Eden. It's not going to become heaven overnight. It's going to be even more difficult. According to the prophets, the first, uh, you know, the big war is going to destroy two-thirds of the world instantly. Um, and uh, the remaining third are going to, according to the prophet, are going to, in essence, be... Uh, tested like you te- like you purify silver, meaning that even the remaining third don't uh, you know are not necessarily guaranteed or assured that they're going to also survive. So, really, the only assurance that we have is uh, of survival, of of being okay, is by looking into the instruction set that Hashem gave us called the Torah and trying to compare our lifestyle to it. If we're compliant with what it says, we're fine. If we're not, we're not fine. And that's one thing that we see in Proverbs. King Solomon said, The foolishness of man, meaning the sins, perverts a person's ways, which means brings him to punishment. But his heart frets against the sham, meaning that a person makes sins, which leads him to punishment. But then he goes, what does he do? He gets mad at Hashem. No, this is not what we want to do. What we want to do is instead of getting upset at Hashem for any punishment, for any hardship, whether in this world or the next, all we can do is look at the Torah, try to follow it to the best of our abilities, but really, really the best of our abilities, not just like halfway, and then we have nothing to complain about because we'll be fine. Hmm. And that's, that's one thing that I think everyone needs to take into account. Everyone that wants to watch our Musar lessons can go to my website, bezlatashem.org, which is B-E-E-V-R-A-T-H-A-S, hem.org, or uh, can uh, email us or go on YouTube. You can type my name, your own Reuven, uh, on YouTube, on Torah Anytime, and many, many other places that we teach really what Hashem said in accordance to His opinion, because His opinion is the only one that matters. Okay. Uh, Gordon in the chat room is asking, uh, where does the, the third temple come in? Does that come before Mashiach, after? No, since, since the Mashiach is going to be the... Uh, the king of this world, uh, if you will, then it has to come after the Mashiach comes. So first you're going to have a war, then you're going to have a, uh, uh, even more hardship after that of uh, salvaging the remains and trying to, you know, the, the few remainings are going to, uh, the Mashiach is going to decide who's going to be saved, who's not out of those. And uh, people are going to have to make a choice. The ones that are 50-50 are going to have a very, very limited type of choice to make at that point. Uh, and then, you know, the salvation of the Bet HaMikdash, uh, you know, the, the Holy Temple, uh, and uh, the next chapter of this world, the last thousand years, is going to play uh, its role at that point. And then eventually, I believe it's 40 years later, there's going to be the resurrection of the dead. Hmm. So is the Mashiach going to live a thousand years? Mashiach is never going to die, and neither is, uh, you know, he, he's going to be someone that uh, Hashem instills a power. I mean, there is... I, uh, some, some teachings from our sages that there are going to be two Mashiachs, meaning there's going to be a Mashiach Bet Yosef, Mashiach Bet, uh, Ben David. Uh, Mashiach Ben Yosef, they say initially is going to die uh, in the war, and then is going to be resurrected with the dead, but Mashiach Ben David never dies. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a lot to learn, and as you said, we have to prepare for this time, and if it comes in a more gentle way, which, you know, there are different opinions how the Mashiach is going to come. There are, as you know, there are many rabbis who are also saying that it will come in a much gentler way. You you basically want to put our antennae up and say, don't, don't rely on that. It could come in a very, very rough way, and we have to be ready for it, and we have to do our due diligence in order to prepare for that. So, um, so the preparation is very important. That means to do more Torah, which means that you should choose a rabbi that uh, you want to follow. Of course, a kosher rabbi, an orthodox rabbi, someone like you. Or if anybody wants to email me, if you're looking for someone in your area, then I might be able to help you. Um, but uh, is there any last thing you want to say before we uh, before we go? Yes, for all of those people that believe that it could come in a wonderful way uh, where there's going to be peace and salvation. And, uh, you know, I wish it, it were true. I wish it was true that it would happen that way. Uh, and this is not necessarily me trying to scare people, but it's just if you look at the world around you, it's just not realistic to expect it. And even if it was possible for it to happen in a nice way, 
it's the ones that are going to be saved still have to comply with the Torah, because you can't say that you're going to expect Hashem to change the Torah specifically for you, where Moses and all of the righteous people that are in Gan Eden had to follow the Torah, but you that don't feel like keeping Shabbat, don't feel like keeping kosher, don't feel like keeping anything, you expect to be in the same Gan Eden, in the same heaven that they are. That makes, that's unfortunately, a, uh, the foundation of heresy. So even if there is a nice way for it to happen, which I don't personally believe is possible, you still have to do tshuva. You have to re- return to God and do the Torah, do, do the mitzvot. And by the way, if you're not Jewish and you're listening to this show, then you're going to want to look into the Noahide movement, the seven laws of Noah, which every human being is obligated to do. Rabbi, can you give out your email uh, address and contact people for anybody who wants to be in touch with you? Yes, absolutely. We help a lot of Jews, a lot of Noahides, and a lot of converts every single day. But Hashem fulfilled the will of Hashem. We even have a conversion series uh, online that people can watch. My email is yaron at bezrathashem.org, which is Y-A-R-O-N, at B-E-E-Z-R-A-T-H-A-S-H-E-M.org. Uh, you can also go to uh, to uh, to see our website with uh, several hundred hours worth of uh, lectures, short ones, long ones. Uh, we have weekly shiurs and lectures, and we both of them go all over the world. All right. We try to uh, spread the Torah. Thank you so much. And you'll want to share those videos as well. Thank you so much, Rabbi Yaron Reuven, for coming on the show. Thank you, Rabbi. You've been listening to the Tamariana Show here at Israel News Talk Radio. Thanks for being with us. If you love Israel News Talk Radio, then you'll love our Facebook page. We keep you up to date on what's happening in Israel, plus little surprise treasures that we don't share on the radio. Go now to follow us on Facebook. Just look for the Israel News Talk Radio Facebook page. And don't forget to subscribe and follow us by clicking on the like button. We post great stuff there that you'll want to share. Israel News Talk Radio on Facebook and Israel News Radio on Twitter. News, opinion, and more. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. 